So for, for those of us who are joining now, we decided what we do while we wait to kind of get our critical mass for our evening here of conversation with Raquel Fornasaro and Dr. Claudia Avalese is have a tour of Beacon Gallery, thanks to Talia Skurlock, who is behind the camera here. Um, so she's up at the front of Beacon Gallery right now. Um, I unfortunately am not in the gallery, but in there in spirit. And so you may have been into the gallery to see the exhibition, may not have, but this is a chance to virtually enjoy it. And um, yes, yeah, so you can see we have the three, the wise monkeys here, which were carved out of coconuts and covered with a substance similar to cero. So the powdered glass, which is the name of our exhibition here, which we'll be talking about in greater depth later. And then we have a piece that really for me embodies a lot of the show. I don't, I don't want to reveal too much of, of my uh, feelings, I would say, you know, considering uh, how much is going to be said by our two guests. So uh, one of my favorites, which is um, two of the models for much of Raquel's work, swimming in a river of bubbles. We have more monkeys here. And you'll notice if you get up real close that they're holding phones. And then we have relativity, glass, plastic, metal, globe, a fantastic sculpture. Beautiful in the light. Around the corner, we have one foot in the grave, one of the more surrealistic paintings, and pearl, another one of the sculptures in the exhibition. For those joining, we're just having a brief tour around the gallery before we get started with the content, just to allow people time to get in. So more of the works, we're gonna be talking about them. I don't wanna talk too much in too great detail. So we're looking at a lot of the installation shots here from the exhibition. The works were installed um, by Raquel and myself a great time putting it all together, seeing what would work together. These three in particular really enjoyed putting up. Um, we have one of the plastic balls right in front of it, which may be discussed as part of the teller um, tether piece later. And the kite, and then we have deny, one of the smaller uh, pieces in the exhibition. storm. When our guests are sitting behind us. Um, they may discuss the works that are behind them that you can see in miniature right now, later, but we're not going to go back and, and see all their secrets. Big Boy Pants and Brumadinho. Um, these are some of the pieces you see when you're walking down the stairs on the left. Cunha Poranga is the largest piece in the exhibition, and one that was just recently finished. And a Sampa. Another sculpture, tether, plastic wood chain. Some of the smaller vignettes, Bird of Paradise, the Water Lily, Trianon Park. We have Queen of the Night. And in right here we have our installation, Raquel's installation called the Synthetic Garden, which in particular has glass that everyone can see right underneath it. Thank you, Talia, for giving us all such a wonderful up-close look at that. And then to the moon and back. So yeah, if you don't mind giving us just a shot of the whole exhibition. You see a beautiful sunny day here in Boston. Wonderful. And there is the digital piece too we have on the wall of the kites. What I'm gonna do now is we're gonna go over to Um, 
one little thing to be able to share with you what we have going on. Um, that is not what I want at all. Can I get a thumbs up if you guys can see my nice presentation on your screen? And a thumbs down if you can't. Probably um, Claudia and Raquel, that's going to be you guys. Can you see? Yes. Yeah, yes. can. <laughs> okay. And um, for those of you who may have a question or something, please put it in the chat and I'll have a look at it and can try to help you out. So we're gonna get started now. So we just had a little look at our artwork. I'm gonna go on to introductions. And Raquel and Claudia are, are going to have their conversation and we'll have some time for Q&A. I'll start with a brief introduction. First of myself, I'm Christine O'Donnell, the owner, director, founder of Beacon Gallery, which is in uh, Boston, Massachusetts in the South End. Um, we're a contemporary art gallery committed to social impact, thoughtful, thoughtfully curated exhibitions, original conceptual art, and sharing compelling messages. Um, we strive to provide a platform that celebrates art, creativity, and advocating for those issues that affect us all in a shared society. We're delighted right now to be hosting Raquel Fornasaro Cerro, which is on view through Sunday, July 16th. This is Raquel's second solo exhibition with Beacon Gallery. Um, and she's had some other exhibitions where we've been showing her work as well. Uh, what I have underneath here is, which I'll read to you, is the um, explanation that was at the front in vinyl, which I think is a great, brief explanation of the concept behind the exhibition and was written by Raquel herself. And she did a wonderful job with it. Ciro is a Brazilian name given to a mixture of glue and powdered glass applied to kite lines. The result is an extremely star sharp string, perfect for taking down an opponent's kite. In this exhibition, Ciro is a metaphor for the cutthroat nature of capitalism, taking the viewer through a visual experience exploration, I think that we had a little autocorrect issue here, exploration of the externalities of our capitalist practices. Upcoming events, so you're here this evening, delighted to have you. We are having a Brazilian street food dinner, which will be a um, not a sit down event, but kind of a standing and walking around and talking and getting to know other people event coming up on June 29th. Uh, for tickets, you can go to the QR code you can see on your screen now. Um, there are also links that you can find on social media or just contact me. And then there's First Friday coming up on July 7th. Lots of opportunities to still interact with the show before it ends and come and do something social at the gallery. On to our two guests this evening. We have our artist Raquel Fornasaro who is uh, originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, she originally received her BA in advertising um, from the Pontifical U Catholic University of Sao Paulo. She also attended the Corcoran School of Art and Design. And her work has been shown in galleries, universities, museums, including MIT's Media Lab and the MFA. And she lives in Newton, Massachusetts with her family. Dr. Avalese is originally from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and she's currently a professor at Tufts slash the School of Museum of Fine Arts. She obtained her PhD in art history from the Free University in Berlin, Germany, and was an associate fellow at the Courtauld Institute in London. So she's really a citizen of the world here, all over the place. Um, Principal areas of interest for her are the visual culture in Brazil, indigenous art, material culture, global art history and theory. And her recent research focuses on, on indigenous arts in Brazil, um, the imaginary of forest and ecology. Her scholarly work has appeared in many peer reviewed journals, including the Art Bulletin, Perspective, Res Anthropology and Aesthetics, and the Journal of Art Histi Histiography. Um, at Tufts, 
this is something that I just recently learned. You will be running an international online teaching program devoted to Brazilian non-Western art traditions with the support of the Getty Foundation in collaboration with Unicamp and three other universities in Brazil. Very exciting. And with that, I have images of the work to follow, but I'm mostly going to now turn it over to you guys to have your conversation. I am going to stop the share and kind of pull back here. But what I will do is I will pop on to put images up if it feels like it's relevant. We've seen most of the pieces already, but if you want me to show anything, either of you just ask, or if anyone in the audience wants me to put anything on the screen, just ask, or if I feel like it seems relevant, I will. But this is, while it's a webinar, feel free to put your questions in the chat if you want. It feels relevant at the moment, I'll ask them, or I'll save them to the end when we're having a little Q&A. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to you two and try to make myself as dis to disappear. <laughs> I'm gonna fix this a little. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Zalia, for the walk around the gallery. That was great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming by. Thank you for being here. And thank you, Claudia. Thank for you. coming by. <laughs> wow, it's a it's a real, real privilege and pleasure to be here tonight to talk about your wonderful work. Um, yeah, I think we could get started by hearing you your story. No? Could you tell us a little bit uh, about your trajectory, how you became an artist or why you became an artist, and how do you get to the US coming from Brazil? Yeah, well, um, I, as Christine mentioned, I, I was born in Sao Paulo, um, right in the edges of the city, and I never quite liked it. I think that's the truth of it. Um, I always felt a bit more connected to the forest life than to the city life. And that was something that always kind of bugged me ever since I was young. Um, so as soon as I, I managed, I actually grabbed my bags and I, I, I left the country. I was already in my twenties when I, I was able to do that, but I found myself in the U S almost, almost by mistake. It wasn't really quite planned. The idea was to come here, stay for a little while and then move on to, to Europe. But as many immigrants know, how we plan is not usually yeah. how it happens. I met my husband and 19 years later, that's that's where I am. Um, in the art area, I did always know, I think, that I wanted to be an artist ever since ever. Um, and I, as we were talking before, um, I always felt that art is not something that I chose to do it. It's something that chose me mm -hmm. to represent. So I always, it was one of those kids that I, I was always doodling. I was copying images and doing some sort of work that would drive my parents crazy. Uh, the family wasn't always very artistic, so it was the kind of practice that for most of my life I pushed aside and that's how I become um I'm, how I ended up doing advertisement and marketing and all of that it was the closest thing a to art right? exactly <laughs> how can I take a life that I still can do some sort of something related to art but not quite there yet um, I did that for four years, the entire time that I was in college, I was working and I went through pretty much all the steps of advertisement. I did the print, I did a little bit of TV and I, 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 and as I was jumping from job to job, I was getting closer and closer to the realization that that was not what I was supposed to be doing. So the moment that um, I finished college. I said, like, hey, but this is it. I need to, I need, now is the time to try something else. And coming to the U.S. was the moment that I felt almost like freedom enough mm -hmm. to be able to pursue something that I did love. And I felt for whatever reason that I couldn't accomplish in Brazil for actually many, many reasons. 
So here I felt that I was free enough to, I have, I had the support to my now husband and I felt that that was the moment to, to try it out. Um, I did do it in, in parts. I stopped many times to have my children and I really dove into the family life, which I absolutely love it. Uh, all of it was very related to art. Yeah, it so, nourishes you as well. Right? Absolutely. So it we was see a lot of your children. They are <laughs> everywhere. They they influenced yeah. tremendously. But now that they're bigger, that they don't need me so much, I feel it's like okay, now I it's the time to fully dive in and and to to take a deep breath and yeah, take the take art as a profession yeah. finally. Yeah. <laughs> no, and it, you're starting really well, I think. It's such a beautiful exhibition. But um, one thing, going through the gallery, looking at the works, I was wondering about like the process. How do you come to the point where you start a picture? And also your relationship to photography, because um, I know I can see, we can see that a lot of um, your starting point are like based on photography. Yeah. So the work usually comes in two different ways. Sometimes it's an idea that comes first. And sometimes it's an image that I cross either on my family pictures, on an outing or a, a article that I'm reading through online. Um, when that is the case, I just collect those images and I have a folder and I just throw them in for a later moment. Maybe an idea will match with those images. When the, mess, the message sometimes goes first, and it seems, it seems silly, but sometimes you just wake up with that idea and then I chase a model mm -hmm. to pose for me or I go online and I... I I try to find whatever elements to compose the image that I have it in my mind. Once I have the images, I throw all of them on Photoshop mm -hmm. and I make a collage with them. So that's the number one step. And I almost kind of can tell what they're going to be, but Photoshop is that step one to kind of know and get my my images organized in a way that I can visualize a little better. Then I paint. Okay. Then I throw them into the canvas and not always they stay as they were. A lot of the times the ideas don't translate so well in painting and I modify them as I go. But if I'm lucky enough, whatever I imagine and I can translate, it can be a very quick painting or it can be a painting that's painfully long. Yeah, <laughs> we have some examples here. Yes, right? definitely do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Another thing that I notice is that you um, you are always like telling a story. There's a lot to unpack in your work. It's a very narrative work, um, um, and it's very personal, right? It connects. We can feel sort of a the memory or you know a testimonial aspect to it. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah. Um... I always I always appreciated looking at images, looking at um looking at paintings that tell a story that has that narrative behind it. Because that grabbed me in a way that almost I can almost say what was happening at a certain moment in time without living at that time. And in a way I feel myself as a historian. So I like to, I do like to tell stories and I cannot write for the sake of my life, but um, the way that I tell those stories is visually. And the more elements that I add to each painting, the more details that story it's gonna be it's gonna be telling for 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 the viewer to try to, if they want you to try to understand a little more, to dive into. Or if they don't, just suck it in the colors and and stay in the in the surface. It, that's fine too. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a, I think a really important point that you're making because um, I think your work has so many layers. 
you can absolutely just walk into the gallery and enjoy it and kind of play with your own imagination and ask yourself, what are, what are we seeing? What, what is this about? And kind of guess and like really enjoy uh, the work in that way. But um, I feel that there's a lot that connects in a very subtle, beautiful way to Brazil because what I like in your work is that it's not, um, there's no stereotype, you know, when we, especially in the U.S., you know, there's um, like a, a, a vision of what Brazil is and imaginary around Brazil that is very absent in your work, but it totally speaks to the country, the politics, the experience of being there, you know? and I think that is really wonderful, and I I don't know if you, if you could, as uh, I think it would be really nice to talk about some of these paintings. Um, and I'm really um, curious about Trianon, for instance. Mm. I think for me, that's one very good example of how you deal with uh, your experience of Brazil, of everything that goes on there. You talked about like also capitalism and how that happens in the periphery but through an image that is so simple and so universal at the same time. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about yeah, that it, it's, it, it's interesting that you use the word universal. I think okay. there is something as, um, as an immigrant, and you know that you've been hopping countries, um, there is something universal about the human um, attitudes mm -hmm. and the human cities. We all sort of, there, there are differences that's granted, but there are many things that are very similar everywhere you go around. And one of them is, um, it's the people. You find all kinds of people and you always find the people that have less of a voice. Mm -hmm. And I do like to talk about those people more often than not. Mm -hmm. um, Trianon is a wonderful example of that. It's um, Trianon Park is the park that it's directly across the, the Museum of Art in Sao Paulo, the modern art. And it's a beautiful park in need of lots of work and repair. Uh -huh. uh, but the people that you see around that, around the area, well, it's right at the Paulista, right? Uh -huh. Paulista Avenue, which is the most famous avenue in Sao Paulo, the most rich, yeah. I think. It's like the financial center. It's the, the financial city, right? center, it's exactly. The banks and like all the uh -huh. business. So I think there is no other place in, in the city that translates to that capitalist yeah. dic dichotomy between the rich and the poor. You see there the, the work class and the guy that's just, he represents the vast majority of Brazil. But then if you focus on the side that's right outside of the frame of the painting, maybe there is that full suited man with his Rolex passing by. It's just Brazil reflects and whenever you go there, you see a lot of that yeah. disparity. It's just, it's, I feel that in the U.S. is slightly hidden. In Brazil, it's in your face. Yeah. Just, you see, contrast, yeah, right? yes, yes, yeah. the contrast is right there in one block. You see extreme, extreme poor and extreme richness in, in the exact same space. Mm -hmm. And they coexist, not always well, but they have been coexisting at least for my entire life. Yeah, I would say from the very from the <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. something that we, we continuously talk about and we continuous, continuously try to improve, I love that our flag talks about order and progress and it's that it's the hope more than anything. It feels like we're always hoping for the progress. We're always hoping for the order. And some of us work a little harder on to accomplishing that. Mm -hmm. Some of us just, I think, they just feel that they it's unreachable. Yeah. And, but at the same time, you talk about the flag and the logo and uh, yeah, the word progress. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think your your work um, also touches on that because it points to a different kind of progress because, you know, the progress we are, they probably were thinking of when they wrote it on the flag, 
it, it, it is a kind of progress that uh, kind of took us to where we are yeah. with all the ecological crisis. We certainly progressed in time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's really, really, your work speaks a lot to that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's also very site specific in that respect, mm -hmm. right? You, um, it, it talks about uh, Brazil is very central to um, the global uh, ecological crisis yeah. because it has the biggest, mm -hmm. like 60% of the mm -hmm. biggest forests in the world. And um, I think um, like a gigantic coast and so so much nature that it has been lost so threatened, right? Yeah. One thing so, that I just it really stuck to me, and it goes back to living in a city, growing up in a city, but not right in the middle, right in the outskirts. So I saw the progress of the city in the depth of the of the forest. Not that I never really lived in the forest per se, but I've seen beautiful green spaces being devastated in order or this mm -hmm. amazing 12, well, I don't know. So nowadays I think it's 30 stories, 30 stories tall buildings being built up. Um, and one thing that we don't talk about and that goes back to my infancy learning about Brazilian history is that, well, you're from Rio, I'm from Sao Paulo. The coast of Brazil was pure, forest yeah it was the mm -hmm. Atlantic forest and when I was yay big uh I learned that we only have what two percent left eight percent, eight percent. Still, it's almost nothing it's absolutely yeah. in comparison and we are still doing exactly the same mistakes with the Amazon so we had already we had two forests mm -hmm. and we devastated completely one of them in trade-off pollution, um, unsafety, everybody's just in, you live in the city and you know people are more stressed, just the lack of greenery, the lack of space, it's just the, the air pollution, all of it touches us negatively. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I really like to talk about. And I um, almost in a way of just kind of pointing out historically what I've seen happening and I in, in a hopeful way just putting it out there for people to maybe stop and hopefully think a little more about the ways that we are goes back to capitalism capitalism goes back to colonialism it's all intricate of a fabric that it started with wanting more and we still want more, mm -hmm. even when we talk about being green, there is a lot of wishful uh, green companies out there. They say that they're, they're cutting the carbon footprint, but they're still producing a ton amount of stuff that nobody needs. So there is a bigger conversation behind capitalism mm -hmm. that we should, I feel that we should be talking about and we're not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, super interesting. But I would love to go back to some of the work so we can we don't get too abstract and that <laughs> we can see that going on in your in your painting. And um, so I think a, a really good example um how site specific your work is, because as I said, it always if you know Sao Paulo, you you can immediately know the place. No? Maybe we can talk a little bit about bubble bath, for instance. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, because it's, I think it's a, a it's a painting that maybe for an American public it has kind of like a a, a really playful element of being in the bathtub yeah. as a child. But if you know um, the city of São Paulo and you've been close to the river there, it has another dimension so i think yeah, it would yeah. be really interesting to to reflect on, on all that yeah. you're talking about by looking at yeah picture. so bubble bath does look very cheery from <laughs> afar um i did make a point to add a little, little bit of a city scape mm -hmm. on the background in the forest uh bubble bath is um it's a painting thinking of the tieta river in sao paulo which is maybe the most polluted in the city 
uh, if not closest to be in the world. Mm -hmm. It's a river that doesn't flow. I think that's the main thing. And the Tieté took maybe two generations to get where it is. Uh, it was beautiful. I remember my father talking about going down and swimming in the river. It was probably not wise <laughs> already because in the 70s, 60s, it was already not all that good water. But nowadays, it's just absolutely, it's a sewage. It's yeah. not a river anymore. There is no life. And sometimes it foams. Mm -hmm. And that's what is that picture is about. It's just, it's not, um, it feels playful, but I'm actually, again, talking about pollution. Yeah. Uh, so it's the kind of, all my work, I try to, to make it in a way that I captivate people before I tell them mm -hmm. what they should stop to think about. And what I actually like the most about this painting is that I had conversations with people from other countries mm -hmm. and they all, after a few minutes, they recognize and they, they come up with, oh, but in Colombia, we yeah, have that yeah. issue. Oh, but the Ganges, it's also, so it's, it, again, it's the universality yeah, of, yeah, of the human attitude mm -hmm. toward the environment. We have been doing this for many years. Mm -hmm all over the world, some places more than others. And um, yeah, it's just living in Boston and looking at the Charles River, that side gives me hope. Mm -hmm. So maybe there is a little bit of that hopeful side to the painting, but it is a warning more than anything. Yeah. Except that we have to think that the world is all connected, right? Yeah. yeah. Like we, we can live a privileged life here because... <laughs> And very are true. not so well yeah. in other parts of the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah awesome. it goes back I, again, it goes yeah. back to capitalism. One painting that we were talking about, <laughs> and I think I have to connect is the Iron Man. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, Iron, <laughs> Iron Man has some Paul in the background and he has that that place I very identifiable. If you've mm -hmm. been in Sao Paulo, you can you can find some buildings that you might have stepped your stepped in. And but Iron Man is just American figure. Mm -hmm. And it's it's something that I think Brazil and the rest of the world, we do look to the US a lot. Mm -hmm. And we we cater to America a lot. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't do us any good. As we follow a culture that is not our own, so we ignore our own culture mm -hmm. to follow a culture that we shouldn't. And that painting also talks, it's talking about Sao Paulo, the, the life in the city, the pollution in the city, and how this overpowering imagery that it's not our own, it's just permanent in the city. We emulate in a way that maybe we should we should not yeah yeah and you can see the dark horizon right which is a very very common it's, uh, it's my horizon morning <laughs> yeah my morning so um, i would wake up very early to go to go to school and i had this bridge that i had to cross over dutra which is this gigantic uh railway highway in brazil and as I was crossing, the horizon was like that. black. Yeah. And that was what, maybe 6 a.m. It's like, this was my every morning. And I would hop onto the bus and knowing that that was the direction I was going to towards. Yeah. So to see, it's all, the, all those feelings. It's like, this is history. This is my history, but it's also our this is what we are we're working towards too, still, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. And you have another picture that is maybe my favorite, mm -hmm. uh, that is called Sampa. And Sampa yeah. uh, for us from like that no uh, Sao Paulo is actually the nickname of the city. Yeah. We refer to Sao Paulo as Sampa. And I think that's really interesting when we compare it to uh, Iron Man that has like this overview of the city. This is kind of like an immersion into uh, what the city sometimes looks like when you're just walking, mm -hmm. strolling across. But it's also, it speaks to me about resistance through graffiti, through this um, 
you know, kind of subversive um, art that in the U.S. it has become a very, very much part of the art and, and, and to yeah. an extent in Brazil as well. But yeah. for a long time, it was like a mode of resistance yeah. or protest yeah. in the yeah. state. Criminal. Yeah. 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 Well, it still is, I think, criminal. Yeah. And the, the funny thing about graffiti is that if you really go back into it, we have graffiti, which is renowned, right? Mm -hmm. All around the world, people love graffiti. It's artistic, it's gorgeous. But we have pichasson. Pichasson, yeah. This is more like pichasson. This is You're more right. pichasson, yeah. which is the has the artistic wannabe, uh -huh. but it's more. We use it. It's it's almost like it's a language. It's right? a language yeah. exactly. So it's uh, we use the streets, and that that was my first introduction to let's say art and resistance because we would just go out in the night and it's like we would just write messages mm -hmm. and usually the, those messages are oftentimes politically heavy we mm -hmm. it's it's a platform going back to the people who have no voice that's how people in Sao Paulo and Rio and in Brazil in general that's how we express our frustrations with the politicians and the mm -hmm. issues of the city. You can't call the the main journal, the main newspaper, and complain. They won't do anything about it. But you can go in your neighborhood and you're gonna write down everything that you should <laughs> that you feel should be should be changed. And it's the first um first way for people to actually, especially teenagers, to be able to explore. I think we lost. What's going on? Yeah. Everything's fine you over here. Your... Oh, okay. all right. Yeah, sorry. I think my phone is connected and I received a call. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, people who are watching, you can feel free to make a comment that host and panelists will see if you're having any issues. And that, that oh, okay. painting too, you're talking um, about the resistance and the talking. So there is a bunch of elements. Um, again, I do a little nudge to American politics. If you see in one of the speaker space, the one, the only one that has eyes actually, inside the mouth has a little poop emoji. Uh -huh. And it's the emoji that people were drying out with a toupee to talk about Trump. Uh -huh. <laughs> so there is always one nudge here and there with yeah. this just it again, it's the way that people in Brazil, the the ones that has the have no voice, they communicate and they put their frustrations out there. Yeah. Yeah, and there's another element that I think is very it's a way, a mode of uh, of uh, you narrating stories, mm. which I think is really interesting, is this use of the animals. Mm. So, if you want to like tell us a yeah. little bit about that, we can see here behind us other two examples. And from Ajin, there like you always you have mm. like this mode of. I you know, yeah, the it's difficult not to again. I keep going back to growing up in the city. The main animals I've seen when I was in the city were the rats, dogs, cats, and pigeons. And, and then at some point on the weekends, we would be able to go to a little farm area. And then you had a bit more of a connection with other animals. And one thing that city life teaches you is that where humans are, animals are not. Mm -hmm. And the way that we behave, we treat the animals is very clearly not beneficial to anybody, much less the animals. So at one point, I did this whole series um, called Zoomorphs. And Zoomorphs was initially thinking, at, at that point, my, one of my kids was very young, and she became obsessed with... Um, um, Egyptian gods. That got me thinking about how when our gods were animals 
well, we had a bigger respect to to the to the animals, to the fauna, flora, to all of it. Once the once the gods became became humans, that's if it felt I might be wrong, but it felt to me that that was the moment that we detached ourselves from the biosphere, mm -hmm. and we almost we and we have been living in a way that we we're superiors mm -hmm. we're not in the same realm so it's okay if we kill it's okay if we burn it's fine and now we got to a point that we are realizing finally that it, that attitude has consequences mm -hmm. At the moment that I was painting those images I started collecting the name of animals that were in the endangerment list and I had I think I completed maybe 10, 10 paintings and at one point I realized this is this it's an unending kind of routine. Mm -hmm. Just every time I would go back into the list, there were more and more animals being added to it to the point that you realize all of the animals are in that list. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's safe. And and again, I had the animals as well, the children in animals masks. Um, the whole point of you wearing masks is another very human point. Mm -hmm. We have been doing that ever since we we can, I guess. Um, we stand. Mm -hmm. And it's a way that we can identify a little more. We can see ourselves a bit more as part of that culture, a part of a bigger, a bigger piece of the world. And in the same way, the children being coming by as ven uh, uh, to venge, avenge mm -hmm. the the attitudes that I, I would like to say ancestors <laughs> took, but I think our generation is very much into that. But thinking that the younger generations, they they have to be the ones to deal with the biggest mistakes that we have been created. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones to come and hopefully try to fix everything. So almost them coming as teachers, as avengers to the attitudes that we have been taking towards the environment. Yeah. And one of these pictures I think that are very significant is Brumadinho. Yeah. I, don't, uh, I don't really know if the American public knows what that is about, but I think it's um, where you again um, talk about environmental disaster through you know, the lens of children and animals as the ones being threatened, trying to survive the catastrophe in there. Yes, yeah, so Brumadinho was 2019. Interestingly enough, I had started the painting before the accident. That was one of the paintings that I, I had the image, I had the kids in the tree from, it was an image that I took in Sao Paulo of my kids and a couple of friends. And I had the trees, I have the children, they had normal faces, and Brumadinho happened. Mm -hmm. And I just dove into this dark black hole of images and videos mm -hmm. that the rescuers were putting it out there. Almost like saying, well, the government's not doing anything, the institution's not doing anything, the company that created this issue is not doing anything. So we are going to post every single image that we can out there so the world may be seeing and may help us with something um i'm not sure if that part happened but my take on it was i need to talk about it i need to make i, I need to make it in a way that it becomes more visible mm -hmm. so i collected a lot of those videos a lot of those images and they are the ones that are in the ocean of redness um on the very background right in the center it's the logo of the company valley mm -hmm. which the, gr the green and the yellow almost mm -hmm. like making mountains and the vultures this one was a very specific choice because the vultures that's the king vulture it's found in minas gerais which is the city of brumadinho uh, this mm -hmm. the state of where brumadinho is and the, the vultures, they're very special, right? They're almost like the immune system of the world. You can have 
you you can't really have many animals that are able to eat that meat, survive, and actually restore that. Do whatever comes out of it, it's something as pure as it can be. Mm -hmm. So you can give them this this meat that's just unedible to any other animals, and he will eat it, and he will produce something that it's actually good for the environment. So the the vultures are there almost like in that in that sense that they're the cleaning crews, they're the only ones that can savage whatever disaster uh -huh. that happened. Romadin is a painting that I do like it, but it makes me very sad uh -huh. because I know it's a problem that happened before, five years, I think, before. They, they had something like that in Paraná, maybe. Uh -huh. And I remember reading about um, the other dams that they have, and they have hundreds oh, yeah, if not all of them to burst all about to burst so it's it's again i'm yeah. talking about something um i had people from other places other countries telling me it's like oh this is this from italy is this from this like no but again it resonates because it happens many many times in many different places yeah and it has a uh... To me, uh, Romadinho is especially significant because this is like a mining company and um, their waste basically was broke uh, the yeah. walls that were retaining it and this kind of like um, mud right. covered a huge yeah. part of the region. And um, it is a region that is really historically significant for Brazil. It came very close to one of the, you know, UNESCO patrimony cities of Mariana, which is uh, where the Brazilian Baroque, like yeah. 18th, early 19th century works are. And um, so it's uh, not, I mean, how the, the lives that it costs, but it, it is also very, very close to uh, which yes, is this Nyochink, world renowned yeah. outdoors museum full of art. Mm -hmm. So, um, is that part of uh, absolutely of what you like yeah. because it's so culturally, yes, significant. absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's something that you felt it should, it should have received more attention than it did, and somehow. Somehow people people manage to hide under the rug all of those those issues that we should not we sh we should just learn and stop hiding and we don't we keep repeating the mistakes and going back to it all and capitalism and all of that Vale which is the company they're not thinking when they're building their dam they're not thinking that they should not build their village. Right for under, right yeah. underneath so it's just like it's the kind of things like they they know if you stop and you think slightly you you know but they just didn't care and that's where capitalism again goes in mm -hmm. you're doing something more you're doing something just thinking on how much you're gonna make it and you're not really paying attention on the externalities what is what is the consequence that's going to happen mm -hmm. and it can be good i'm not against capitalism I, I i don't know if there is any other system that it's better or worse but capitalism is not perfect but it can be better mm -hmm. there are positive externalities and there are negative ones the problem is that we don't care mm -hmm. and when you when you don't care chances are the negative points are the ones that are gonna take over. If we care a little more and we think a little more, maybe you don't build the city right under the dam, you just slightly above. Or if you see a crack, you go and you fix it, but they don't care. They're just thinking, no, it's we can do it now. It's too expensive, we'll do it later. And the lives, the people, the nature that was destroyed everything it's like we we're talking about humans lives but, but how many animals just yeah. all of it just completely devastated yeah yeah so maybe we can like um look at pamad as well mm -hmm. right i think it's a it's another really interesting and Pamar is another and one that has a specific place yeah there. and you'll have a series of works that uh kind of like connect to, yeah. to that painting yeah the globe the the yeah so tamar yeah. is the painting um i think tamar actually came in second the globe came first okay. so i went to fernando de noronha 
which is this amazing place in the northeast of Brazil. It's, it's a, a natural reserve. It is uh, a natural and reserve. It be very controlled, but it's yeah. been invaded now by tourism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's definitely dominated yeah. by tourists. Um, and not only by tourists, which, which um, I think touched me a little more was the fact that while walking on the beach, you would see all that trash that was not from the island. Mm -hmm. So there was a bunch of garbage that was just washed ashore. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. And, and I started collecting a little bit of the trash, the garbage, and the, and the glass. The glass became, all the shards became the Tamar globe. And um, Tamar is actually the name of this institution in Brazil that takes care. They, they started just trying to help the turtles and it became something much more, right? Now it's just mm -hmm. they, they take care of the environment around all the other sea animals. And in one of the walks there, we were talking to someone, um, one of the researchers, and he was telling us how the vast majority of the animals that washed ashore, they come in with plastic inside of their bellies. And that really, again, stuck with me. And I started thinking of Tamar, mm -hmm. um, the painting, and how a lot of the garbage, a lot of the trash is just trash that it's not, it doesn't belong to the space. And again, the children as educators, they're almost like putting on a play. It's like, this is what we're doing. This is the attitudes that we're taking. Every single turtle in the painting is a turtle that I found online, became actually viral for the wrong reasons. Mm. So one of them is the one, um, the one that's holding the, the apple and the straws is the turtle that I think everybody saw the video of the poor turtle with the straw up their nose. The one with the rope around its neck is a turtle that was found in Florida with that chair attached to it. It was at the time the turtle was just bones actually. And the other ones, just the many turtles that in other animals that get stuck in the fishing nets. So again, it's just the, the, uh, bringing awareness to something that we actually all know. We just, a lot of us just try to to brush it over, I think. Mm -hmm. Whenever I'm buying something, fish or otherwise, so that you try consciously to buy less plastic, to do the best that we can. But it's it's a difficult challenge because it's not always... Um, you go to the grocery store, it's not an issue that we as individuals can solve, it's a bigger issue. And that's where the capitalist practices really come to mind. It's something that it's bigger than one of us. We all have to take a better um to take better choices, especially the ones that are that have the chance to to make a real change. Uh -huh. Yeah. Raquel and Claudia. Um one question for you about this and the topic of Tamar. And then I might suggest that we move on to a couple of questions because we're very quickly approaching seven o'clock here. Um, you talked about the Tamar globe. Is that the same as the piece relativity? Oh, yes. Yes. Let me I just show that for people just so that they know that this is the work that we were showing early earlier that has evolved in title. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, <laughs> Uh, name, name my children many names <laughs> they all have nicknames yeah that's the one and it's it's hollow so you can actually I wouldn't suggest but <laughs> you can hold it and you can shake it and whatever is inside it's some of the garbage that I collected on the beach emulating uh -huh. the garbage that's found inside the stomach of the animals thank you okay very interesting um all right, I'm going to stop sharing now. We have one really great question, a lovely comment. And I would say for anyone else who might have a question, now is the time to put it in. We have about five minutes left uh, before we're going to wrap this up. Um, so a question from the audience. Can you speak to whether there are any spiritual or religious aspects infused in your works? Mm -hmm. How or are the African spiritual elements 
how do the African thinking um, spiritual elements play a role in your work? I ask these questions because of the overarching presence of the African cultural practices, your use of mask and botanical representation so much in your compositions. So great yeah. question, please. Yeah. That's interesting. It's just uh, Brazilian culture is African culture. Yeah, and, yeah we're talking about the, the masks. Um, yes, Africa right there. Um, the plants, the plants, these plants here are typical for African religion. Yes, yeah, yeah. The, so the, the painting is a perfect example. It's yeah. the sword, and again, plants that I thought this plant I had it. I grew up in my yard, and it's a plant that I think every Brazilian has in the begin in the entrance of their house. It's a protective plant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the masks go also back to Curupira, which is also one of those entities that it's it's native Brazilian, it's a little bit Portuguese, it's a little bit African. I think the entirety of Brazilian culture has so much of African influence for the worst reasons possible, but it's something that nowadays we we admire. So I'm happy that we have those connections. I'm very saddened for the how those connections came to be, but you, it's something that we can, I cannot detach from the work because that's the culture we grow up in when you're in Brazil. That doesn't matter where, which city you, you live or where your family specifically came from. We all, Brazil is a big melting pot. I wouldn't say religion so much. I try to step away from religion um, in, in the sense of the one God, but the African religion in that way is way more forgiven because it's, um, it, it relates to a lot more of us. So my, I grew up as a Christian, I was raised Catholic Christian and very quickly I realized that was just not for me. Uh, but the other cultures in Brazil, we talk a lot of um, macumba, and it's just you go to the tejero and you the dances and the spirits, all of that is just absolutely gorgeous. And it is understood as metaphors, mm -hmm. and it is a way of more, uh, a, a way more respectful way of dealing with each other than I think my family actually chose to. I have. Um, I have a big influence of my Italian side of the family and that's the side that I think it's just it was just so Puritan in the way of thinking religiously and it's a way that up to this day I try to detach a bit more and actually dive a little uh, a little more in the in the culture of the of the native Brazilians or um, any other natives around is that it goes back to the respect of nature and to uh, the respect of animals that those cultures have way more than the America the the Western colonial cultures had. Yeah. Wonderful. So now I have a comment that I'll read followed by a question from a different person. So, so beautifully said Raquel, the polarity of the rich and poor coexisting in the same place are very visible in a lot of countries. Which I'd say, yes, very true. Um, and then so many of the humans in your work are children, which to me points to new life and hope. Is there an intentional message there? Absolutely. Yes, that's absolutely it. Um, not to say that we're lost causes, mm -hmm. <laughs> but having children of my own, it was the moment that I realized like we, they, they, it's up to them. It's a, we are doing the best that we can. I think a lot of us living in Boston, I see that a lot of us really try and, and struggle in the right direction. But the truth is that it's, they are the ones that are gonna have to actually do more. Unfortunately, I don't like that because that's the generation of my children. It's, I feel unfortunate, I feel it's unfortunate to them, but, um, I think they're up to the task and I think we're learning. And I think luckily enough, our generation woke up enough to be able to guide them, to guide this next generation to, to actually start in a, in a better way. 
Wonderful. <laughs> and maybe as a final comment, um, this was the original question um, asker of the the African um, spiritual and cultural elements, um, who is our friend Napoleon Jones Henderson, as it turns out. Um, your works are very engaging. Much of the various religious beliefs can be seen in your works. And so I guess, which goes to the fact that we all end up having our own interpretations of the art that we see and see and pull out different things within them. Um, so I'd ask, I'm gonna put myself back on video here. Um, I'd ask if you guys have any final comments here before I kind of wrap things up here at, at 701 and then I'll kind of give my thanks. Yeah, I just wanna, again, thank you, Christine, for all of it. Mm -hmm. You've been very patient. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Claudia, really, thank again, you. absolutely wonderful to have you coming and talking to me about the art. Um, and thank, thank you, everybody, um, to be here too. Um, I hope you all enjoyed. I hope you got some curiosities solved, but, I really want everybody to just look at the pieces and do not think of what I was thinking when I created. If you're curious, please do ask. I am I can talk an end about every single detail, but I absolutely love to put the work out there. Once it's out there, it's not mine anymore. It's just for everybody to read into their own lives and take whatever message they wanna take. And if they do take a message, amazing that's that's all I, that's all i need thank you thank you so much for inviting me to come into this world i think the exhibition is you know really it shows who you are as an artist um, it's very coherent and very beautiful to be in the space as well so it, i feel really privileged as i said it's great thank, thank you much. also christine and for this invitation Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> yes, on behalf of Beacon Gallery, let me thank both of you so much for being here tonight and sharing all of your thoughts and questions and responses with our guests. And thank you to all of our attendees this evening for being here. Um, it was a wonderful presentation and a chance, Raquel, to look at your work in greater depth. I would invite everyone who's on here to come and see the work in person. If you haven't seen it, um, we are open by appointment. And then we have regular hours Thursday through Sundays as well, 12 to five. And then on Sundays, 11 to four. Um, we also have our first Friday coming up on July 7th, as well as our Brazilian street food dinner that's on the 29th of June, where you can find tickets either via our Instagram page, Facebook, and we can always send you the link as well. Um, so thank you again, all of you who attended, um, and we hope that you have a nice evening. Take care, thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.